Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jermana Tarek Abdurazak. I'm studying for a master's degree in petroleum engineering at the University of Houston, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Today, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Mohamed Suleiman, a very special guest from University of Houston. Dr. Suleiman is the chairman of petroleum engineering department at U of H. Dr. Suleiman has a long industrial and academic experience. He holds 35 patents on fracturing operations and analysis, testing and conformance applications. He's an author or co-author of over 250 technical papers and articles in various areas of petroleum engineering. Dr. Solomon is a registered professional engineer in the state of Texas. He's also a distinguished member of the Study of Petroleum Engineers and fellow of National Academy of Inventors. He has authored several book chapters on stimulation and testing. Dr. Solomon is the primary editor of Fracturing Horizontal Wells, published by McGraw-Hill in 2016. He is co-author of Optimization of Hydraulic Fracture Stages and Sequences in Unconventional Formations, published in 2018 by CRC. Dr. Suleiman holds a bachelor's degree with top honors from Cary University, a master's degree, and a PhD from Stanford University, all in petroleum engineering. And today he will share with us his expert opinion on fracturing horizontal wells. If you haven't already, please make sure to check out our previous sessions on PyPetro YouTube channel and join our Facebook page, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, for the latest updates on our upcoming courses. Please feel free to send your questions in the chat box and we'll answer as many questions as possible. With that, I ask you to give your full attention to Dr. Mohammed Suleiman and help me in welcoming today's very honorable guest. Welcome, Dr. Suleiman. Hi, Dr. Suleiman. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad to have you on PyPetro. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm putting this lecture as the fifth lecture for uh, the series that we presented before. There was uh, four other lectures uh, that covered uh, various aspects of uh, fracturing. Uh, this lecture is uh, a very basic introductory lecture of fracturing horizontal words. Uh, so it's, uh, it is not... Uh, is not a comprehensive fracturing horizontal ones. As uh, Jumana mentioned, uh, we, I have a whole book close to 500 pages, if I remember right, on fracturing horizontal ones. So there is a lot to say about that subject. So here we are covering a little bit, introducing you to, to the subject, because it is an extremely important subject. Uh, let me... And let me start uh, first uh, talking about horizontal ones. So why do people uh, drill horizontal ones? Uh, well, it's a very simple question. Basically, uh, uh, people have drilled horizontal ones for a very long time, for many years, but uh, it, it really took off back in, in the 80s. Uh, about mid-80s. About mid, mid to about mid 80s. Uh, so we're, people started drilling horizontal wells. And the main reason for drilling horizontal wells at the time was basically larger flow area. When you drill a vertical well, you, you, the area of flow is uh, nothing but the circumference of that vertical well, which would be the diameter 2 pi, uh, 2 pi r of the well bore times the height of the formation. When you go horizontally, and now the, the, the area becomes a lot larger. There is obviously some issues uh, involved there. I'm not going to get into it, but I have it in, uh, in my book. I uh, talk a lot about it, and it could be another subject uh, for, for presentation. So it's larger flow area, so you could, uh, you, you will produce uh, at a lower pressure drop, or at, for the same pressure drop, you can produce a higher rate. But also people uh, drill the horizontal well to intersect the natural fractures. If you intersect the natural fractures, then your productivity is a lot higher. 
Uh, there was um, some applications that we were done to reduce possibility of um, water or gas uh, cresting, which is same as coning, except when you have a horizontal well, you call it cresting rather than uh, coning, because it looks like a crest rather than the water invasion will look like crest rather than uh, rather than a cone. And it, uh, for a long time, even before that, it was used in enhanced oil recovery, especially in Canada, what you call it uh, a SAG-D, uh, where, where you drill two horizontal wells and you inject steam in one and you produce oil from the other using dri uh, uh, gravity drainage. But when we started doing the started drilling horizontal wells as a, at a large scale in mid eighties. Um, I was lucky that I was working for a company that was taking care of some special research project. And uh, we, we thought, how about if we create fractures in it? And in this case, you create multiple fractures. And when you do that, your production productivity of the world increases a lot more so it became one subject, you drill horizontal wells to fracture it. You increase productivity very much and you take care of issues of presence of say, streaks of low permeability. So that became, became a reason for uh, drilling horizontal wells is to fracture it. Uh, so this is just a slide showing if we, we did that, that was done in the Austin chart in here in the United States, you drill horizontal well, you intersect natural fractures, and all of a sudden your productivity of the well increases very much. You can see if I drill a vertical well, the chances of intersecting natural fractures is a lot lower than when I drill a horizontal well, especially if I approximately know the orientation of, of the natural fractures, then I can drill perpendicular to that, then my chances of intersecting natural fractures increases tremendously. And with a vertical well, it is a hit and miss uh, situation. Actually in Austin chart, in, in case of horizontal wells, we went in and we fractured uh, some of these wells. So you can see fracturing tight formation. Austin chalk obviously is a very tight formation. A fracturing tight formation uh, drilling horizontal well and creating uh, transverse fractures through the horizontal wells was, has been around for quite some time. Actually, some of the work I'm going to show you uh, uh, we probably did in, in mid to late 80s. So it has been around for some time. Some people think that fracturing horizontal wells did not happen till the shale revolution, which is not true at all. We fractured the horizontal wells from in the mid 80s. So the candidates obviously are the candidates for horizontal wells are the ones that will be makes make the world more successful. For them formation, natural fracture formation, low permeability formation, you increase productivity and you can fracture the well, uh, especially if you if you don't have very strong stress contrast. There is uh, issues obviously with, um, with predicting production from horizontal wells. So, so one needs to understand that to, to some extent. It's not crucial to what I'm going to talk about, but it is it's good to recognize this issue. If I'm drilling, if I have a formation, say it looks like, like this, flat formation, and obviously you don't have flat formation anywhere very rarely when you get something like that. But let's look at an idealized situation like this. If I drill a vertical well, all I need to know, I need to know the height, I need to know the bore radius, and I need to know maybe the average radial permeability. If I have Kx and Ky, many times people will calculate an average perm from Kx and Ky. And just to make it simple, the average is not is not uh, algebraic average. It is geometric average. That, uh, in case of horizontal well, now you need to know the structure. You need to know Kx, Ky fairly well. 
So you, you make your decision and prediction correctly. So you need to know Kx and Ky. I need to know the height, but also the length of the well and where the well is located in that, uh, in that reservoir. I, uh, I have a document that I have in, uh, in uh, ResearchGate. If you search under my name, uh, I have a long document that talks about all that stuff in details. If you're interested, find it and uh, you can download the PDF file and you, you can read it. It, uh, it would used to teach it for in, over uh, more than one day. So let me look quickly on, uh, on the rock mechanics uh, uh, issue when I create uh, a fracture in a, in a horizontal well. Okay. So the first thing you, you want to remember if you have taken the, the first or attended the first four lectures, at least one of them regarding stresses, is that uh, if I have, if I'm creating a fracture, a fracture will propagate perpendicular to minimum stress. Uh, sometimes someone will say it is parallel to maximum stress. It, it, this may be somewhat okay, but actually, mathematically, it's not exactly correct. It is perpendicular to minimum stress. Uh, it's, it's a little different between perpendicular to the stress versus parallel to stress. Perpendicular to stress, it gives you one, one orientation. Parallel, it can be multiple orientations. So, because you're talking about a line and uh, a plane. So, uh, when, I, when I drill a vertical well, a vertical well, um, if I look at the minimum stress, the minimum stress is usually horizontal. So, so when I create a fracture, I really do not need to know the orientation of stresses in advance. Of course, it is important to know that orientation if you are drilling multiple vertical wells and multiple fractures and you wanna, or you're doing things like, uh, uh, for example, water flooding and so on and so forth, uh, which you can read about in the document I mentioned to you in ResearchGate. There's a lot of there's a discussion about that. Uh, so it, it, uh, it is not absolutely necessary to know the, the stress orientation. And people use, although we used to, to try to determine stress orientation, we, we've done a lot of work in, in that area, in very important area that we discussed in previous lectures. Uh, but it, it is not absolutely necessary. In case of horizontal ones, it's, it is really necessary and to know the stresses before you drill the horizontal well. Because if I, you think about it, if the fracture is going to be perpendicular to minimum stress and I want to create transverse fracture, then the, the, the horizontal well has to go in direction of minimum stress so I can, when I fracture it, I create a fracture that is perpendicular to the wall bore. And in this case, I can create multiple fractures. We'll see, we'll talk about how to do that uh, later in this lecture. So, uh, so if I wanna create transverse fractures, then the well, the well bore has to be drilled the, in direction of minimum stress. <clears throat> so that means you need to know the stress is in advance, in the stress orientation, you need to know it in advance. If I want to create longitudinal frac like this one here, then I, I can drill, like if you see what I'm writing here, you drill in direction of maximum stress. Uh, so transverse fracture, you drill in minimum direction of minimum stress. Uh, uh, longitudinal frac, you drill in direction of maximum stress. Well, if you, how about if you drill in a different direction? Well, as we are going to see that you may end up having a fracture that is coming out perpendicular to the wall bore, but it turns around in space. And we are going, I'm going to show you in, in a few minutes that this may not be exactly a great idea because when it turns around, it creates some issues. 
So here, so the, what we get out of the slide is, is that knowing stress orientation is actually very important even before you drill the horizontal well. You can't just drill it in any direction. So transverse fraction, like what I just talked about, uh, just to give me one second. So transverse, tra to create transverse fracture, I mean drill, I drill the horizontal, the first, the, the well going in vertical direction, that's what it usually do. And that kickoff point, it turns in a curve, eventually going horizontal and I can create multiple fractures and the drilling in the direction of minimum stress or very close to it. You know, you, does not mean it has to be within uh, half a degree. We actually found out that maybe even up to 30 degrees is not, is not a huge problem. Uh, longitudinal fractures, you drill in direction to do the same thing, but you drill in direction of maximum stress and you create your fracture. Uh, later on, ask me, please, if um, which is better, whether each of them will apply or not. I may try to cover that as we go. So I'm going to show you some experiments that, I, uh, that uh, we have done. And the, the experiments are, are kind of interesting, but I want to show you what, First, the, uh, the equipment that we use to create the stresses, so you know what uh, how it looks. Basically, with something like this pressure vessel like this, uh, and uh, it broken into three different areas here where I can control every area by itself. So actually, I can apply stress here, stress here, stress here. So you're talking about applying three stresses sideways. I can apply a stress going in this direction, two, three stresses in this direction. So you have, and you got the stress in vertical direction. So I have true triaxial stresses. So I have stresses in the three directions. And in sideways, I can break the rock, I, not, not break it, but uh, I can subject the rock to three different stresses sideways in X direction as well as in the Y direction. So I have X, Y, and Z. The reason I'm doing, we're doing, we did that is to, is to expose the formation to three different stresses to study the effect of stresses on fracture propagation, and uh, not only um, in, in, in one direction, but also what happens in the vertical direction. And you can see that in, in, uh, in some of the uh, ex examples that I'm, I'm going to show you, real uh, experiments. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that. So those are, those are platens that you actually apply hydraulic pressure on the platen and it moves the pressing uh, the rock. I have at University of Houston, I built something, not exactly the same, not three layers, but we built some platen for some other research for stimulation, uh, not, uh, not uh, hydraulic fracturing, but a different type, actually waterless uh, stimulation. By the way, the waterless stimulation, I, we have a lecture on YouTube and it, you, can, uh, you can find it and download it. So that is what, so you can see we are applying one vertical stress, applying uh, stresses in horizontal direction and vertical direction. And we drill a well in the middle and we try to create a fracture obviously in this direction. So in order to create fracture in this direction, those three stresses, I have to be the smallest stresses. So sigma H men, there is one here, second, third, and then the HX max is three and the vertical direction here. So this is the smallest stress. If you don't, if it's not the smallest, of course, you don't get a fracture per, perpendicular to, the, to that minimum stress. 
Okay. So the first thing we wanted to, or one of the things we wanted to study was um, uh, what happens to perforation interval. Can you just have an open hole and inject a fluid and you create transverse fracture? Actually, we found out that this is not exactly correct. So, so what we did, we, we have a well bore. You can see if you, this, this is this piece of rock that we just shown the, the, the previous slide. But what I did here, we are cutting a quarter of that rock. So this is just one quarter of it. And you can see what you have here. This is a wheel bore. And this is, this is the, middle, the middle portion. So I'm looking vertically to, uh, on, on this piece here and uh, horizontally in plane direction and this one here. So we're cutting just one, one part of it, a quarter of the rock. And what we did is we said, okay, Will um, in in uh, we are going to we thought that the effect of perforation perforated interval is very important. And so we we have one case where we have uh, the perforated interval was half the diameter of the wood bore. So we have to do it in dimensionless form. It's not in inches or feet or whatever. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. And nobody asked me. Uh, from here to here, this is 18 inch. From top to bottom is 12 inch. And the thickness of the whole thing is six inch. So six by 12 by 18. So this perforated interval was half the diameter of the wheel bore. And this one was one diameter. So if the if the wheel bore was, in this specific case, was one inch, this is half an inch, this would be, would, be, would be one inch, and this is one and a half the diameter, then three times the diameter, then four times the diameter. Okay, let us see what happened. What happened here, when I have half the diameter, I created, this is one fracture, transverse fracture. Um, we're going to get into the mathematics of it kind of quickly later in, in, in a few minutes. So I see one nice fracture, transverse fracture. Even when I did one diameter, I saw basically the same thing, one and a half diameter, or again stayed as, as one fracture. When, it, when we went to three times the diameter, it looked like we created one fracture here, a transverse fracture, and there was another transverse fracture came from, from the side. So near, near the end of the perforation, we ended having fractures propagating. So uh, if you have a couple of fractures, uh, it, that may cause a problem. And one would say what, what the problem is. Well, the problem is simply is you have more fluid leaking off because I have more fractures than I expected. And so what is the problem with that? Well, it is uh, that that would make both fractures a little narrower than you expect. As long as you know what is going on, is no problem. But when things happen that you don't expect, that can cause a problem. So here, we'll, probably the fracture will be a little narrower than what we expected, and it was a little narrower. If we don't take that into account, propant may get stuck there and you end having a sand out. You have to go back to my old lectures and uh, look for it. Now, when I went, when we went to four times the diameter of the well bore, hey, you did not have that transverse fracture. You, you had more of longitudinal fractures and it was very complex shapes. So our conclusion from here, at least at the time, we said, don't, when you, when you perforate an interval, don't have the perforation more than twice the diameter of the wood bore. Later on, we figured out as we started going to the field, 
that twice the diameter of the well bore was more for experimental work. Um, actually, we found in the field operation that that you can go to four times the diameter of the well bore, and the things go very much as expected. So, so now. Now you can you can uh, you can go to four times the diameter of the wood board. So if if in uh, in a field application of if the diameter of the wood board is six inches, then you can go up to a couple of feet. Uh, if if you have been in fraction horizontal wells, that's exactly what people do when they create clusters, and the cluster is always about a couple of feet. It is about four times the diameter of the wood board. And it is coming out <coughs> of this experiment. Uh, th this, uh, this work was the first work that was done in the industry uh, regarding uh, fractioning horizontal ones. Uh, we, we, we did this work actually in mid 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, the, the second thing was to look at, uh, at creating longitudinal fractures. Well, so we, we have three cases here. One, I have open hole. Open hole meaning there, is, there, was no, there was no casing in here. Here I have perforated. So we, when we cast the rock, we have a bunch of perforations in all directions. It's like what you do now in, uh, if, you, if you perforate a well. The, the third case, we had a slot, as if you do hydrojetting in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And th this is the, in the direction of the fracture. So, um, and you can see stress perpendicular to the fractures is 400 psi um, in vertical direction is 1000 psi in direction parallel to the fracture which is the maximum horizontal stress is 1000 psi too. So oh, one question we could ask you is which one do you think broke at the lowest pressure? Uh, this always I ask this question whenever I teach a graduate or undergraduate class. Um, and, um, I'm not going. I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is, if you think about it, hard is a slot, because I basically initiated the fracture here when I hydrojet in the upper and lower side of the wood bore. And so you, so it's almost like you initiated the fracture, so you have a larger area that fluid will leak off and spread the, the rock. Um, the second one was not open hole, was perforation actually, because some of the perforations happened to be in the direction of the fracture. So it, it did similar thing to slot, but not to the same degree. Open hole actually was the highest uh, stress. Uh, sometimes people think this is, um, uh, surprising, but when you think about it, it's really not surprising. Uh, here in open hole, you have an intact well, so it follows very much the theory. If you look at uh, calculating stresses uh, uh, around the wood bore, what you, you may call hoop stress, it uh, is very high. In addition, I'm going to show you some other calculation. In case of horizontal well, it was worse situation that hoop stress, the stresses you need to, to break down the formation is a lot higher than what you would uh, expect in a, in a vertical one. So if, if it happens that, that the, the well bore is a different orientation, uh, if you do, do not, you do not do things right, it's possible that the fracture can initiate at an angle to minimum stress near the wood bore. That is the influence of the wood bore. But once the fracture goes away from the wood bore, it has to follow the basic physics 
because now the world board is not controlling what is going on. Now it is all outside the, the, the area controlled by the world board. And, uh, and now you're exposed to, or the, the fracture is exposed to, to the far field stress. And what, it, what it has to do, it has to become perpendicular to minimum stress. That reorientation is not very smooth orientation. And uh, we'll show you in a little bit uh, how it looks. It actually, it looks like steps. And uh, whenever you have a steps, uh, it will make the, will, the fracture width or the effective fracture width look narrower than it, than it is. If it is narrower, that increases friction pressure. And also it, it may cause propant to get stuck in those steps and you have sand out. Uh, the, the idea when things turn around getting, having a higher friction pressure and having problems is not only in the stresses here and in fracturing. If you study, when you study fluid mechanics, you see the same issue. If you have an elbow, an elbow in a, in a pipe, and that elbow will correspond to many times, if you look at some of the applications of fluid mechanics, they represented the elbow with a longer pipe to give you the higher friction pressure. In addition, around an elbow in fluid mechanics, you observe a lot of eddies and determinants. So it gives you an extra pressure drop. So it, you, this is uh, in a way similar, but even in a, in a worse situation. So look at this. Here we drilled the well in, uh, in direction to minimum stress, we created the fracture. And if you look at it, you can see, you can see steps going here. So anytime, if, if I'm injecting fluid, uh, only fluid, well, the fluid is going to move, yeah, it would take more pressure drop. That's understandable. But if we if it's real fracture in the field and you have problem coming out, problem will have a difficult time turning around those steps. So you end up having, you may end up having a sand out. Or you have to use a lot narrower proper and less concentration than you usually do. Usually, as long as you know what would happen or suspect what would happen, you could, you could uh, take care of it. So, uh, another uh, picture here that I, I had, this was, was done many years ago by, uh, by Dr. Ali Danashi, and I found this uh, slide to be extremely interesting. He, he looked... This is inclined well. Uh, and you, you can see the steps in a very nice fashion. So the fracture propagated, but it, it does not go straight, it is not smooth, it, since it is, is uh, the well is inclined, inclined meaning in, from vertical. And this was vertical well. You can see those steps. Anytime you have something like this, like what I'm pointing at, that can trap propant, so you 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 can end up having operational problems. A fracture initiation. A fracture initiation when you have a horizontal well. I did some work on this years ago. Uh, published a paper on the subject back in ninety two, I think. 91 or 92, I can't remember. But, but anyway, in a vertical well, we, everybody has been using the Hubert and Willis fracture uh, orientation criterion, fracture failure criterion. And basically, it's three sigma min minus sigma max plus, plus the tensile strength. When, when we try to apply this to horizontal uh, to fraction horizontal, well, it really did not work. And so we went into a very detailed analysis of, of stresses. And I have a paper on the subject and some time ago. I, you will have to download it. I cannot, since SPE control or owns the copyright, I cannot send anybody a copy of it. But 
you can see that the equation is a little different. And one part of, of the equation is, uh, is, the com uh, is unconfined compressive strength of the rock, which is usually very, very high. Here you are adding tensile strength and the most many people will, will ignore it altogether because it's usually 100, 200 psi. It's not, it's not very high. But uh, unconfined compressive strength is more like 5,000 psi. So you can see that adds a lot to, to, the, to the stresses. We ran some experiments, and when we look at those experiments, we, we observe the, the initiation pressure or breakdown pressure was anywhere from this range. And those were multiple experiments, it's not one experiment. I calculated 3275, which about the middle. Um, Hubert and Willis criterion calculate only 1750 in both cases. And you can see there is here, there is a difference. So we know that it's always easier to initiate longitudinal fractures. I was assuming you drill in the right direction. Um, but so if, you, if your perforated interval is very long, you initiate that longitudinal fracture anyway, regardless of the orientation of the well. Because it is easier, it takes a lot less stress to initiate that longitudinal uh, frac. But once it leaves, once it leaves the, the well bore, it will have to be reorienting itself in space and it may cause the problems we talked about. Uh, actually, we, we used to give an example, uh, if you have a freezing pipe, it will not, it will never split in the middle. It will split along the axis of the, of the pipe. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about fluid flow aspects of uh, fracture horizontal wedges. Okay, that's an uh, important subject. There's a lot more, by the way, in the rack mechanics and the geomechanics side. I'm going to touch again on item stresses and stress interference, but I'm just giving you an introductory review of it, the basic stuff. Uh, same thing with fluid flow aspects of fractured horizontal beds. If, if I look at uh, if I look at transverse fractures, I have many fractures, which is obviously very good, uh, but you, one has to optimize those number of fractures. The lower the formation probability is, the more fractures you, are, you need or you would want to apply because you want to maximize the production of, of the well. When we used to run uh, uh, transverse fractures in a little higher probability, not not really high, but uh, several micro Darcy, we, we used to design a small number of fractures, maybe up to 10 fractures or so. Now in shale, is in nano Darcy, you, you have to have a lot of fractures. People create, you know, I saw cases of 100 or a little more than 100 fractures. So in, in a well board. However, the well boards now, the, the way we look at them, a lot longer than what we used to have. So we used to uh, talk about a uh, few hundred, several hundred foot horizontal wells, and now you're talking about thousands of feet. Two, three thousand, five thousand foot is, is not uncommon. Uh, so you can create 50, 100 to 100 fractures. If we have time at the end, we can talk about fraction methods, but I doubt that we'll be able to reach it. So now optimization of number of fractures becomes important. And one has to worry also about conversions of fluid flow. Uh, and sometimes you may need a tillin. We'll, we'll let's talk about this a little bit. A conversion is, uh, you know, unlike vertical well and vertical fracture where fluid moves horizontally towards, goes moves towards the fracture and inside the fracture horizontally towards the, the well bore. Here the fluid moves into the horizontal, into the fracture and then 
more or less readily into the into this area. If you if you think about it, when you study say fluid flow in reservoirs without fractions or anything, and you have a well and you have fluid moving towards the center, you, if you study petroleum reservoir engineering, it would it would tell you that most of your pressure drop is around the well bore because all the fluid now is converging. So the density of the streamlines going near the well bore is very high. And so you end up having a higher pressure drop. Probably 50% of the, in case of radial flow, 50% of the pressure drop is in the first few feet around, around that, uh, that well bore. Uh, used to give uh, a homework assignment to show that, because till you put the pencil to it and do the calculations, which is very simple, very simple calculation. It uh, is difficult to, to measure. And here we have a similar situation. That, that fluid, you know, more than 90%, you know, there may be some fluid flowing directly to the wheel board, but most of, maybe 90, it depends on the how tight the formation is. If it's very tight formation, and 90 plus, maybe up to 99% of the fluid is moving to the fracture and inside the fracture to the horizontal. So it is very important to keep good communication between the horizontal well and the fracture. If the, if the permeability of that fracture is very high relative to the formation, everything is relative. So if, if the mentioned fracture conductivity is very high, then it really doesn't matter. Then you are, you are okay. You do not need to do anything special about it except you want to make sure you have got some problems around. And even that is, it can be discussed later on. It's, uh, so, uh, but if, if the, if, if the dimensions fracture conductivity, the conductivity of the fracture is fairly low, then you need to make sure that you have very good conductivity around, uh, around here, which if you, if you, injecting a fraction treatment, and uh, near the end you inject a bigger propant at a higher concentration, that's what people will call TLM. In case of shale, you probably do not need to do that because permeability is very tight. But in case of maybe several micro Darcy formation, we, we sometimes uh, apply that exactly, that exact concept. concept. And, you, you can see uh, it depends, it's all depending on the meshes fracture conductivity. Um, so the, the, lower, the lower the curve, the better, because this is dimensionless pressure, which essentially dimensionless pressure drop. So in case of regular fracture, I get this pressure drop. In case of transverse fracture, I get this, Curve here. So there's that more pressure drop that you see for, for the meshes conductivity of 10. But if I go to the meshes conductivity of 100, you would not be able to see a difference between these two curves. Okay. If, if you think you are going to have an issue, then bilinear flow, I'm not going to discuss this slide too much because we don't have a huge amount of time left. So if, if you if you if you have if you think you are going to have a problem, and then then this graph will will uh, would be helping very much in in designing a TLM. By the way, this is part of a paper that I uh, presented back in 1987 or 88, uh, around that time in 88, and uh, it got published in uh, SPE and. Uh, 1990 or 91. That's a long time ago. So that choke effect is, is only a problem when you have low dimension fracture conductivity. If you have good dimension fracture conductivity, then it is not an issue. And if you think it's going to be an issue, and then you, you can tell in with higher concentration, maybe stronger problem, bigger problem. 
Um, you, it's maybe not a good idea to over displace the treatment. However, depending on the formation strength and mechanical properties of the rock, one could over displace a little bit. Uh, how a little bit is very easy to calculate and I'm not going to get into it now because it's, it's really beyond what we are discussing here. I may have discussed it a little bit more in the previous, uh, in the previous lectures. Um, you, you, you predict your production either uh, using a simulator in this case. However, there was some paper by um, Michael Economides many years ago that he represented the problem of solving basically a pseudo steady state uh, solution to it. And he said, hey, if I, I can add this, uh, this extra pressure drop near the wood board, like what we do in, uh, in radial flow by adding skin factor. And where the skin, he said, it would look something like this. Uh, it is okay for first attempt. Uh, the, the solution I presented a little earlier that I showed it to you here, this is not for steady states, for, for unsteady state, which frankly is not common to see steady state or even pseudo steady state with fractures in a situation like this. And so the problem becomes a lot more complicated and more difficult to solve. Do, you, do, do fractures, uh, productivity interfere? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one reason you want to run an optimization uh, technique, you simulation, you do optimization for production. For longitudinal fracture, we talked a little bit about it. And basically here I'm repeating what I said earlier where uh, the well is derailed perpendicular to minimum stress. That means the fracture is going to be going along the, along the fracture, uh, along the wellbore axis, sorry. This is not fracture, this should be along the wellbore axis. I will correct it when we yeah, get on. <laughs> Transverse fracture, the reason we use it is because it gives you a very good coverage of the reservoir, it gives you more production, it's a lot of acceleration. You can create small fractures. So even if you don't have very high stress contrast between the upper and lower zone, uh, the upper and lower zone relative to the phase zone, you're still okay. Uh, it is really, really efficient in low probability formation. And, uh, and you can intersect the natural fractures too. So we say it is very efficient in low probability formation. And this is the reason when you go to shale, you're, uh, you're, nobody uses longitudinal fraction, uh, fractures in, uh, in shale. It's all transverse fractures. Uh, and these advantages... Uh, uh, designing, you have to be careful in it. So you, you need to know stress is better than, than even if you're doing longitudinal fractures. One issue also that we have found out some time ago is uh, narrower fracture width at the wood bore because of the high stress. And the, that's related to the high breakdown pressure that we discussed earlier. Uh, however, the, the cleanup is also the cleanup is kind of difficult. So, so you, you want to design the fraction treatment so you don't lose a lot of fluid. The higher pressure drop, we discussed it, so you can take care of it by tailing. So here how it would look in, uh, in transverse fracture if you drilled just a cartoon to explain how the fluid is flowing. It's going to be coming from far away like this, from the other side also, from X and Y. And once it comes close, now it turns around and then inside the fracture, turn it towards the wood bore. And longitudinal frac is, is simpler in a way because it moves towards the fracture and 
depending on the aspect ratio, uh, it, you may be able to represent the behavior of an you know, of a longitudinal frac with uh, with a vertical, well vertical fracture. So it's easier to uh, to predict uh, productivity. And uh, one may ask, one uh, one may ask, uh, uh, one may ask whether uh, longitudinal fractures have been applied anywhere. And actually, it has been done. It's been applied. I know in Europe years ago. People thought that this would be mechanically easier to, to handle or operationally easier to handle. It was applied also in some situation here in the uh, United States, in the Hugoton field. Although transverse fracture would probably would have been better because the formation was not that high perm, but uh, uh, it was very special case. Uh, that was applied by mobile oil. And uh, there was, so the, the reason behind it is because they were trying to cut costs, the wells were not too deep, and they wanted to, to basically save on, on, on cementing and the casing and perforation and just to create a transverse fracture. And the follow at the very end was high pressure to create a trans, create longitudinal fracture, I'm sorry. Longitudinal fracture, and then at the end, the high, high flow rate to create, to create transverse fracture at the, at the end. Okay. <clears throat> so if I look at how the fluid would, uh, would behave, uh, if I have transverse fractures, uh, you, you start the first with linear radial flow, and like what we discussed earlier, there are equations for it. It's uh, fairly complex equations, but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's not as simple as, as bilinear flow. Mm -hmm. And so you have fluid flowing linearly, and inside the fracture would be radially, like what we showed. Uh, eventually, uh, if the pressure drop, if you go investigating, in, uh, the investigating area is longer, something like this here, you're seeing from far away, most of your pressure drop will be in the formation. Once this happens, then it behaves like linear flow. In, in the first case, the linear radial flow, here when you have uh, significant pressure drop inside the fracture and inside the formation. So 50, 50, or 40, 60, 30, 70, and something like this will behave like linear radial flow. Once you see more than 90% of the pressure drops happening in the formation, then it will behave like linear flow. And if you remember from, from previous uh, uh, lecture that I have, I have given, I told you at the time, linear flow will always appear as a square root of time. So you plot pressure drop versus square root of time, boom, you get a straight line. Or if you do it loss, uh, if you take the logarithm, then it, uh, uh, then it gives you a half a slope. So the reason log log would be half a slope. Uh, then it goes into some intermediate transition, transition period, and then eventually, you will be seeing very far fluid flow, which will be, uh, people predicted this to be compound formation linear flow. And after a long time, if you have a huge reservoir and you wait for a very long time, that depends on the, the rock properties as well as the fluid properties. When we talk about time, is not time in minutes or days or hours, it's dimensionless time. After very long dimensionless time, which probably in cases like shale, it will be forever. It will never happen. You, you end seeing maybe pseudo radial flow, like what we discussed in vertical fracture and vertical ones. Uh, how often do you see those? Uh, not very often because you're, you're considering here that and that your, your the reservoir is huge, 
and nothing is happening, everything is homogeneous, and what you're seeing is is large area around the, around the system. That doesn't, and nobody is going to leave the rest of the area open like that. So I, it may be theoretically or uh, of interest to look at compound formation linear flow and pseudo radial flow, but uh, practically you will not see them. Here I just added a, a slide. There was, this was part of a presentation I've given a few years ago. And it shows that you don't wanna, if the formation probability is even, is 10 micro Darcy, you don't wanna lose conductivity. So if I have good uniform fraction, my productivity is like this. If, if 10% here, you know, if 10% if is, if I have no fracture, I'm here. If I change now, 10% of the fracture is lower conductivity. So here I'm going, this is more than 100. So it's basically an infinite fracture. This 10% went down to 50, to 5, to 0.5, to 0.05. You lose a lot of productivity. So that tells you that you don't want to lose conductivity near near the fracture bound, which is the, the intersection of the fracture and the wood bore. And let me look at uh, stress interference. And this is an interesting subject that uh, you will be hearing a lot about it. Uh, not, not for me, I, we have a lot of papers and work on uh, in the area that we published or presented. Uh, uh, and uh, if, you, if you have a chance to look at, the, at that book that we have written, although we have done a lot more work since then on that same subject. So what is the stress interference? Uh, before I get to it, uh, I do not know if any of you have listened to my other lectures. When we talked about hoop stress, we said, we have a vertical well. Before I fracture it, I'm looking at the stresses around the wood bore. The stress around the wood bore increases very much, assuming that the wood bore is stable. So you, you have, if I have X and Y around the wood bore like this, I would say if this is if this sigma H man, this is sigma H max, the hoop stress will change from one point to another uh, from maximum of three sigma max minus sigma max min and minimum is three sigma min minus sigma max. Okay, but it's so regardless of which one, it depends on where you are around the wheel board, but the important thing is a lot more stress, a lot higher stress. But we also say that if you go three, four, maybe maximum five times the diameter of the wheel board, the effect of the wheel board doesn't exist anymore. And if you're measuring stress, say five times the diameter of the wheel board, so 10 times the wheel board radius, it's as if there is no wheel. You know, the measurement will not, will not be affected by the wheel board. So let us look at fracture and see what happens. Well, if I have if I have a fracture like this, I'm going to look at the change in the stresses perpendicular to the fracture, parallel to the fracture in in the horizontal direction, and parallel to the fracture in y direction. And I'm going to look at here. I'm going to look at two extreme cases. And because we have solution, analytical solution for it, then we're going to look at the general uh, case, which uh, elliptical shape, and then we can look at any regular, any irregular shape that we, but we had to do that numerically. I don't want to take credit for the numerical solution. The numeric, the, no, I take credit for numerical solution because my students developed that. Um, 
but for the analytical solution for uh, semi-infinite fracture or penny-shaped fracture circle. That was actually done back in the 40s. And when I started looking at this problem, I, the first thing you do when you're doing research on something like this is to figure out is whether anybody else has solved the problem. It saves a lot of headache. You don't want to waste your time solving a problem that has been already solved. So I found out that Snedden, back in 46 or 47, you know, back in the 40s, even before I was born, had solved the two problems, the semi-infinite fracture and the penny-shaped fracture. And the solutions were published. The semi-infinite fracture solution is fairly simple because it's, it is a two-dimensional problem. But, but the penny shaped fraction is a very complicated, it's like, you look at it, it's, it's a fairly complicated solution, but, it's, but the solution has been developed already. So let us look at the, the two situations. This in the, in this, in the semi-infinite, uh, in, in the semi-infinite fraction. Uh, the, the green line, I'm sorry, the, what is written here is not exactly correct. It not, does not correspond to what I have here. Do, is it? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It does correspond to it. I'm, I corrected it. So this here, if I create a fracture at this point, and I'm looking at the change stress, divided by net extension pressure. And you remember net extension pressure, we'll talk about the extension pressure minus minimum in situ stress. So I'm saying if, if this is one, so that change in my stress is equal to my net pressure. And net pressure, remember again, it is pressure difference. So net pressure, when I say net pressure is a, Fraction propagation pressure minus minimum stress. So if it's 500 psi, that tells me that stress perpendicular to the fracture is going to change by 500 psi. At, at this, if I go some distance away, and the distance, now we're doing it in dimensionless format. It is distance divided by height of the fracture. So. It, it would be that height here, distance. So if I'm going, if I go distance like this, I'm saying I'm going half the height. If I go this way, maybe that's equal to the total height coming this point, this is twice the height. So I'm plotting this change in stress divided by net pressure versus distance Dimensional is distance as L divided by H. So you can see perpendicular to the fracture, it's fairly high, very large change in stress. If you're very close to the fracture, it drops very quickly. And after some time, you know, if I go to four times the, the, the height of the fracture, basically there is no effect, as if it is not there. Uh, even, even at three times, the effect is very small. So the effect here, lasts a lot longer distance than what we were talking about in Wellbore. And the, the simple reason is you have fluid leaking off, you have a lot of fluid leaking off, the changing stresses, you're also compressing the rock. And so you have the effect, the effect goes longer distance than what you do in a Wellbore that we talk about. Most people will say three to four times the diameter of the wood board. Five times to be generous. Five times you don't hardly see anything. But here, in case of fractures, it lasts fairly long distance. So this is perpendicular to the fracture. This one is parallel to the fracture, it's horizontal. Actually, it shows that in this case, it may even become negative. Becoming negative meaning that the stress will decrease, not increase. 
See, if it's positive, I know its stress is increasing. If negative, it says after some distance becomes negative, that means that means stress will actually decrease. And, um, and in vertical direction, it's starting at 0.4 and then it declines going to zero fairly quickly. Okay. And so if I, I did not include that here, but, but if I have two fractures in the, since it's a problem, if I look at it as linearly elastic problem, if you have a linear problem with linear condition, boundary conditions, you apply the concept of superposition. It's similar to what you do in a drawdown and build up. You know, if it is linear equation with linear boundary condition, you apply superposition. Superposition is a is a concept, is a mathematical concept. All it says that when you have linear equation, linear boundary condition, you can add solutions algebraically. So you can say A times S1 plus B times S2 plus C times S3. You can add them together. Those can be a solution to another problem. So when you have a complicated problem, if you can break it into simpler problems, that you can solve each one of them by itself. And if the equation is linear with linear boundary condition, you go back and add those solutions, it will be solution to your more complicated problem. And that's what, uh, if, you, if you studied the reservoir engineering, or well testing, that's what exactly Horner equation is. So we do the same, we can do the same thing here. We actually did it in a, in a paper that I, I published uh, about 15 years ago or so. In, in the penny shaped, uh, you think about penny shaped, the Y and Z, well, the, the horizontal direction parallel to the fraction and the vertical direction parallel to the fraction will be identical. So you can see this is perpendicular to the fracture. This is, this is the two, the X and, uh, and Y. Okay. If you if you look at it, you you find out that uh, the effect, or whether it is semi-infinite or penny shaped, the, the difference is not huge. Okay. And then we we develop some numerical solution. I will. Uh, I will look at it a, a, a little bit. Now we wanted to calculate uh, not only minimum stress, the change in minimum stress, as we are going to see here, but also we wanted to look at the change in uh, shear stress. So look at this. You see my fracture as uh, the, the fracture is... Uh, is propagating, you can see interference bet between them. And you, you have, you have, this is, uh, let me go back again into it, would we'll show if distance between fractures is 800 feet uh, in, in this case, and in this case, 100 feet, you can see there is not a whole lot of interference, at least in this specific case. In the middle is back, same original values. Uh, shear stress is here. And the reason we are interested in shear stress is because that's what probably will, will cause, uh, will give you the micro seismic that uh, you listen to in order to define what the fractions are. If the distance between the fracture is 700 feet. You can see that there is there is still not much uh, not much uh, interference in the stresses, but uh, it looks so close. Now it was it was four five hundred feet. Now they're affecting each other very much, and you can, as I said, if you so is you if you get the solution, which is published solution, you add them together, you can get this. Uh, 
Although this we did uh, numerically rather than analytically, but you can do it analytically. Um, and look, now you're with 400 feet, it's a lot of interference. So we, in order to take advantage of that interference, um, we, we build a, a new fractioning technique. Rather than going fractioning one after the other like this, we said, hey, if, uh, if, if we're going to see here that we are changing the stresses in the middle, maybe we can take that, use it as an advantage. And what we did is we say, okay, if I create this fracture, and then I created this fracture, if, if you go back, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, uh, you go back to this one, to this slide. Uh, you can see in the, as, I, as I go away from the fracture, the minimum stress increases by a larger percentage than the maximum horizontal stress. So the minimum horizontal stress like, for example, if I look at 0.5, just for, for example, if I look at 0.5, the, the minimum horizontal stress increases by 0.7 of the net pressure. So if net pressure, let's say 500 PSI, increased by 0.7, that's 350 PSI. However, the maximum horizontal stress actually decreases by a little bit. And let's say it decreases by 50 psi. So the difference between them, if it used to be 800 psi, now is going to be about 400 psi. So the difference between the two stresses is getting smaller. I can pick an area where I can maximize that effect. So if I if I fracture, have a horizontal well, I fracture the well number one, then I, I, I fracture the well at, at point one, this, this fracture. And I create this fracture such that, that my difference between my minimum and maximum horizontal stress is very small. I actually caused it to be small. So now if I go in the middle and create a fracture here, Guess what? It will be easy for, because there's net pressure down inside the fracture, that net pressure will open those natural fractures. So, so we, the idea I create the two fractures, reduce the difference between the minimum and maximum horizontal stress. And so when I create a new fracture, that, that the stresses that the, the stresses that are closing the natural fractures get a lot lower. So as the fracture is going through them, it will open the natural fractures. But, and then, then I go create fractures. So one, two, and then I go in middle three, then I create four. So one, two, then three, then I go create four and reduce the stresses. They are not reduce the stress, reduce the difference, the contrast, stress contrast between the maximum and the horizontal stress. I create this fracture here, it opens the natural fracture too. So I get obviously the idea is to open more and more natural fractures and I get more and more production. And we call that alternating fractures. And um, at the time we developed, we called it also Texas two step because we're going back and forth. It, uh, it got applied actually in the field, it's, it works, and uh, people that applied it uh, were very happy with it, mostly it was applied very much by Luke Oil in, uh, in Russia, and they wrote about it in the, in the annual report, and we have a patent on, on the technique, except the patent was never filed in Russia, so we don't get anything. Uh, the technique is written in this paper, but we, we have a patent on it. If anybody is interested in the patent, I would just to contact me. I will, I'll give you my email address at the end. 
but the, 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 there is a problem with it. You know, it's uh, operationally it's very difficult to do because you you it's difficult to go back and forth in fracturing. You have problem to left behind. You have to have an area that you can go back and perforate and fracture. So it it was very clever technique, but on the other hand, it was. Uh, was was difficult to apply. We actually, I was at the time I was working for Halliburton Company. The company developed another technique to to be able to apply this one. So here I'm I'm, uh, I'm doing this the same thing with alternating fracture. You see what is happening. I uh, one more thing. Uh, sorry to go back, but one more thing I have to say also. Not only is going back and forth, but fracturing. Since although I'm I'm reducing the stress contrast between the two stresses, but I'm I'm also increasing the magnitude of stress. So the stress becomes a higher. So I'm fracturing against a higher stress, which obviously becomes a. It it can become an issue because you you need to inject at higher pressure. You need to consider that and. In the pumps, you bring it to to well site and so on and so forth. And you can see that in here in those slides, uh, if I have two fractures and now I'm creating a third fracture in the middle, you can see the stress is a lot higher, is red uh, relative to the green we have here. And so. Let me skip this. I actually deleted and I don't know why it came back. We, we developed another technique, another interesting approach when, um, when I, after I moved to university, I first moved to Texas Tech and we did this work in Texas Tech. That was, uh, I, was uh, I moved out of Texas Tech more than five years ago to join the University of Houston. So we, rather than, we, we try to get the advantages of that, uh, the, of the alternating fractures and the zipper frac in one. And basically we said, you, you, can, you create, you have two wells or multiple wells. You know, it doesn't have to be only two wells, but you can demonstrate it in two wells. I think fracture one, two, and then the third fracture is coming from another wheel going in the middle. So I don't have the, the problem of going back and forth. I'm initiating the fracture here at somewhat lower stress than what I would have had if I, if I propagated the fracture from the middle here, from wheel one. So one, two, then I go to three, then I go to four, then five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on, okay? If all that I wanna create is four fractions in each, then I create eight and then I, that's it. Um, let me see. And you can see here, we did this work. That's all numerical work now because it becomes very difficult to do all of that uh, analytically. And you can see other fraction uh, propagation from cluster. We will cover this, and that would be probably the end of the presentation. We, if you have multiple fractures, because right now we, we when you fracture uh, a wheel bore, you you're not going creating fraction by fracture. Usually, you, you're the the common the most common technique. And uh, we're not going to talk about fractional methods now, maybe in another lecture in the future we'll do it. The most common technique is to have a stage and create multiple clusters on it. Uh, when we started, we talked about clusters of say maybe three clusters or four clusters and people keep going in number of clusters. Clusters basically if we have cased and cemented uh, well bore stage maybe a few hundred, couple of hundred feet, uh, more or less. And you go perforate clusters where the clusters are only a couple of feet 
in length. So the perforated interval is a couple of feet. Is It takes you back to the experiment that I showed you earlier that we did back in the 80s. And you create this, you try to create a fraction in each cluster. So uh, people will do it from three clusters to four clusters up to 10 clusters. I think 10 clusters is too many because you end up not creating a fraction in each. Maybe three or four, maximum five, that would be good. But here we're looking at three clusters and say, well, what happened if we're creating three clusters? And you can see the fraction. If, if everything is symmetric and uh, homogeneous and isotropic, and obviously that, that never happened in real life. But uh, let's assume it is, it is the case. You can see what is happening. The middle fracture is going to go straight. The two side fracture will curve away. Obviously that you need a numerical simulator to do it. To, a numerical simulator has to uh, calculate the stresses, calculate the, the, the stresses and the orientation, and it has to uh, adjust the fracture orientation as it goes. Uh, right now, I have a PhD student, very smart guy, working with me, is redeveloping this in a more sophisticated fashion. And um, hopefully very soon we'll be presenting something on, on the subject, looking at natural fractures, looking at thermal effect. Okay, so you can see how the fracture would, uh, would look like, which is, is uh, a very, very interesting and the expected way to expect it to, to happen. Uh, how about when you have fractures coming from the opposite side? And again, assuming homogeneity and uh, isotropy and all of that, if, if you have the fracture coming separated from one another like this, it will, uh, it will turn around. And it will go and basically try to get close to one another. Very interesting thing. Well, when we saw that, you know, it, uh, we thought it, it, looks, it looks good, it looks interesting, but, and, but we, you always can think of it as uh, you're solving a mathematical equation and you get whatever you program. So we, we did the same work. I'm going to show you something interesting in a minute. If, if, every, if you have two fractures that propagated this way and you have a fracture that came in the middle like this, it will, if it's all symmetric, then, then it, the fracture will propagate right in the middle. Obviously, if it is off center, then the effect is going to be shown, the effect of the two fractures will be shown. When it is, when right in the middle symmetric, then it should go right in the middle. Okay, you can see here, when it is off center, it turns around. So what we we went looking for, because you want to show that it, the solution is not just numeric, just an equation. We want to make sure that the equation was done correctly. And you can see here in nature, uh, a granite and granite. You can see it's the fractures are doing exactly, when you look at it, it's exactly either here or micro cracks in glass. It is very much like what we predicted. So that was, uh, was very satisfying. And that was another student uh, that did uh, that work. Well, it did not do the experiment, but found the experiment. Actually, that same student was, was a, another student was co-author uh, send me this picture. He was in the street and uh, looking at pavement. Uh, uh, pavement in, in the United States, if you don't live in the States, is uh, cement with, uh, was reinforced uh, with steel. And uh, we're showing here trucks moving. It uh, created cracks in the cement. And you can see what it's doing to the cement. It was kind of interesting. He, he, he was uh, somewhere, he took the picture and, uh, and sent it to me. He was, he was so excited about it. I, I like that. I like that one would always, you know, having his work on his mind. It's, uh, 
and the student, two students were working in this end. Both of them got their PhD and they graduated. And they're having very good jobs. That, uh, that covers my presentation. It's uh, about, I, we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Soliman, for this enlightening session. I see one question. How do relative probability curves perform around near well bore after hydraulic fracture? <clears throat> well, I, I would think the question, the, what's asking is how it affects, how the relative probability will affect hydraulic fracturing. A very good question, actually. Uh, relative probability inside the formation will not change. Uh, obviously, you may have uh, liquid moving in from the hydraulic fracture, as you're creating the hydraulic fracture, fluid moves into the formation. It's going to follow the relative probability behavior, the, 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 the curves that you have, or the, the relative probability performance of, of the rock. So it's going to stay the same. So it's going to displace, uh, if it is, say, water you are using, or aqueous phase, is going to replace water and oil and gas. Inside the fracture, your relative, it, it, I would use different relative probability curves inside the fracture because inside the fracture, relative probability curves are different than from inside the formation. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar, say, with Corey's correlation, uh, with Corey's correlation, relative probability curves inside the formations, let's say if the sandstone, well sorted sand, that, that, all that stuff, you, you may have exponents of two, usually. Uh, for shale, the exponent gets larger and larger, which means the curvature of the relative probability curves change. Inside the fracture, you may, since it's quite open, you have problem, to, but, but, it's, but, uh, but it's not like grains. It's not like what you see inside the rock. Uh, I, was, I would use, say, if I'm using Corey's correlation, I would use exponent of 1 to 1.5. And it's interesting because I supervise development of a very sophisticated numerical simulator that still Halliburton uses. And we implemented the relative probability curves in the rock as well as in the formation. Uh, as, uh, as well as in the, in the fracture, sorry. And we, we did exactly what I'm uh, talking to you about. So, so the effect is, of course, you, you, if you want to run simulation, you have to look at it in that fashion. Once you, once you fracture fluid wa water or aqueous phase, if you have an aqueous phase, you moves in, it displaces fluid, then it gets displaced the back. And that is the cleanup process. The cleanup process is for what inside the fracture, as well as what's around the fracture inside the formation. Uh, did I answer your question? Probably. Well, that's about it for the questions today. It was a pleasure having you on by Dr. Mahana Suleiman. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone for tuning in with us today. Today's session will be uploaded on Pipe to YouTube channel, you might want to check that out for your final. Thanks again and have a great day. All right. Thank you very much.